Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the live program number 151 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Alexander Lederman from Switzerland. Dr. Lederman is a private docent at the University of Geneva. He's the CEO of BMED and the president of the Swiss Shoulder Society, and also the president of the Foundation for Research Teaching in Orthopedics, Sports, the Four Group. He's also president of the membership committee and a member of the central committee of the European Society for Surgery of the Shoulder and Elbow, and also a member of the central committee of the French Arthroscopic Society. He's the chairman of the 11th Advanced Course in Shoulder Arthroscopy, and he's been the president of the Congress of the European Society for Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in Geneva, and the fourth International Congress on Adipose Stem Cell Trans Treatment in Zurich. He's the editor of the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Arthroplasty. Dr. Lederman collaborates with the Geneva University Hospital, Lato Hospital, and the Clinic of Landin La Colline. He's the author of more than 150 publications in journals and books concerning the shoulder joint. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Alexander Lederman. Over to you, Doc. Thank you. Very nice for this uh, introduction. So. To, tonight, we are going to talk about shoulder and uh, particularly about dislocation. Uh, I would like to introduce a new technique that Philippe Collin and I developed that is called the dynamic anterior stabilization that we do with the long head of the biceps. Um, you, will you will find more information on the teaching website that is a participative website called bmed.com and you have on the BMED a wiki section that will allow you to see everything that, or to reread everything that I said, or to watch again the, the videos, or feel free to register and to go back if you have any questions. Um, the gold standard for shoulder stabilization has been the, the initially the open bone art repair, and then the arthroscopic uh, bone art repair. This has become with time the gold standard. However, subsequent studies show that we had a high recurrence rate between 11 uh, to 23%. And interestingly, uh, up to 38% in subgroups. And these subgroups were patients with uh, bone loss. Knowing that in 90% of cases, um, of cases of instability, you will find some kind of bone loss. So finally, we have a lot of recurrences with patients that have bone loss, and the bone loss is something that is frequent. So surgeons try to improve the technique or to make the technique more stable, and this has been the case of Connelly, who proposed a remplissage. Um, Wolf did it with, uh, with the scope. Um, the remplissage has very good results. So the remplissage is you, you bring the, the capsule and the infraspinatus into the uh, Malgan lesion, also called the heel sacs lesion. And the results that we observed were good. They were um, a slight limitation of range of motion, but this was not statistically significant. However, some surgeon noticed a significant pest, uh, persistent posterior pain up to 33% in the study of Geoffroy Noessa. I did some fellowships. The first one was with um, Gilles Valch. I will talk, talk about, it, uh, about him later on. And I also did an arthroscopic fellowship in San Antonio in 2012 with one of my masters, Steve Burkhardt. And Steve at that time was using a double polytechnic. And every time he was doing a remplissage, I observed that the nuts he was doing was on a muscle. And I said, I was saying to Steve, excuse me, Steve, but your nuts, your nuts are on, on some, some muscle. And Steve was always answering, no, Alex, read more. This is a capsulotenodesis. This is not a capsulomyodesis. So I read, and in fact, he was, he was right. I mean, all the article that uh, you, you could find at that time, it was said that the remplissage was a capsulot and a disease of the infraspinatus. But I was saying to myself, albite does move, uh, like um, Galilei was saying. 
So as soon as I came back to Geneva, I organized a cadaveric study. And this is what we observed. We observed that the suture that we were um, introducing, the, the anchor on the, the suture, was rather passing through the terrus minor rather than the uh, infraspinatus. And this is what happened when you were tightening the suture, knowing that the terrus minor is going, is a muscle up to, almost up to the greater tuberosity. When you were tightening your suture, you were just killing the uh, terrus minor, so the posterior cuff. That is important for anterior instability and also that could explain the persistent posterior pain that we observe that has been described in the different, in different um, studies. So heel sac remplissage is probably more a capsulomyodesis than a capsulotenodesis. You go more often through the terrus minor and not the infraspinatus, like, like it has been previously said. So we don't know if all these findings are really clinically relevant, but it may explain the posterior pain uh, in patients with heel sac remplissage. And since I tried to do remplissage taking only the posterior capsule, so not the muscle, but just to do a capsulodesis alone. Uh, the problem is the capsule posterior is quite thin and I don't know, and I have no data about it, if a capsulode capsulodesis alone is enough. So this, this is my experience with, with the remplissage. I, I did another fellowship in 2000 and uh, seven with uh, Gilles Valch and Gilles Valch teach me the Latage procedure that is the best French uh, surgery of the world. So Latage described this technique in 1954. Um, and there is three principle that has been uh, described by uh, Didier Pat. It's a triple blocking uh, surgery. The first effect is the bunny effect because you in Increase or you restore the anteroposterior glenoid diameter. So you increase so much the anteroposterior diameter that the heel sac lesion cannot anymore engage anteriorly because you length the glenoid arch. So this is one of the effects of the Latarge procedure. The second effect is a ligament effect because you suture the capsule to the stump of the CA ligament or you can reinsert the capsule between the glenoid and, um, and the graft. So the graft is becoming extra articular and you do a nice retentioning of the capsule. So this is a demonstration. You see that you have your graft and when you pull on your suture, you did a wonderful reinsertion of the capsule and the labrum that comes between the glenoid and the graft, making the graft extra uh, articular. So this is a second effect. And there is a third effect that is a hammock effect of the inferior third, third of the scapularis. So remember that the, the hammock effect is when your arm is in slight abduction, then it's becoming a sling effect. And these effects are very important because um, it contributes up to 50 or uh, to 62% of the stabilizing effect of the latarge. So the the dynamic effect, the hammock effect, sling effect are very, very effective. The Latage is a great procedure. We have quite low rate of recurrences, um, around 2%. However, 4% have persistent apprehension. We know that the long-term results are quite good and it has been shown that the, um, this is the best pony procedure. Uh, interestingly, it's not an anatomic procedure and I have to confess that the bronchite is more anatomic, but do we really want anatomy if the anatomy failed? If one of my patients came to in my office and said, excuse me, sir, but my shoulder dislocate. Uh, and I said to this patient, yes, we will redo your anatomy that previously failed. The patient is running away because he wants more than anatomy and the latage is providing, providing more than the bronchite. And this is probably why the latage is actually so, so good. Interestingly, the, the Latarge has a very easy um, postoperative rehabilitation. My patient has slim only between um, zero to 10 days in internal rotation after, they, after this 
they can just remove the, the slim. And this is the clinical result. On your left, you have uh, a patient that uh, is five days after the surgery. On your right, this is the patient six weeks after an arthroscopic latage. And you see that this procedure provides immediately fantastic uh, results with perfect range of motion and uh, usually a very, very good um, stability of your shoulder. So this is the clinic, clinically what you can expect with a latage at six weeks. And this is not what I observed when I was doing isolated bancard. However, we have some complication. They are short-term complication that has been quite well described by Shah uh, in 2012. So infection, neurological lesions, and also recurrent instability. And there is some long-term complications. So dislocation arthropathy is not really a complication of the latage. It's a complication of the dislocation disease. But there is after latage some subscaparis insufficiency, particularly if you don't do a split, but if you detach the subscapularis. Neurological lesions, this is something that we study with uh, Steve Burkhardt. If your screws are divergent, so they, if they are not parallel to the glenoid and if um, they are too long, you can create lesion of uh, the, subscapulary, the subsc subscapular nerve. And with the scope, if um, when, when you do the split, the axillary is at risk of lesion. So uh, there is some kind of risk for the, for the latage, some neurological lesions that are possible. So this is a dissection that we did, and you see that the, the superior R and the inferior screw are quite close to major branch or minor branches of the suprascapular nerve. So your screws need to be quite short, and they, they have to be parallel to the glenoid, like not divergent, like in this case. And the question has been that we ask ourselves with Philippe Conan is, is there something between the bancard the isolated bancard and the latage procedure. And in Switzerland, you know that we love uh, compromise. And we say to ourselves that probably there was something in, which, in between that was possible. We know that the, um, uh, the Bristol, that his um, small variation of the latage is still efficient, even if there is a small graft, the graft in the Bristol is smaller. And even with a small graft, very good result has been reported. And we ask ourselves if, if it was possible to have similar result with either the congenital tendon transfer. So this is something that has been proposed by Tong or the long head of the biceps uh, that Philippe Collin and I proposed. So we were the first one to publish the video on ViewMedi in 2016. Uh, we submitted the technique uh, at the same time with tongue in arthroscopic um, techniques. And this has been published in 2017. And at that time, we realized that there were many surgeons in the world that were doing a similar procedure. There was, there was uh, Oleg um, Nikolevich in uh, Moscow, also from, uh, Rus uh, from Russia. There were people that uh, in, in China, there were people in South America, and when everybody is pushing in the same direction at the same time, this is rather, this is usually a good news. So this is the idea. You have a normal shoulder with the long head of the, of your, uh, of the biceps on your left and the congenital tendon on your right. This is what you do when you do an, a latage or a bristol. You cut the coracoid process and you fix the coracoid process with one or two screws um, on the arterial glenoid, and you use the short head of the biceps and the coracobricalis muscle, so the conjunct tendon. And our idea was to detach the long head of the biceps from the upper part of the glenoid and to do the, to create the hammock and the sling effect, not with the conjunct tendon, but with the long head of the biceps, knowing that this tendon has uh, very often tendinopathy, they, they, there is uh, associated slap lesion and so on. So this is usually a tendon that has some kind of tendinopathy and this is almost never the case of the conjunct tendon. So it was for us quite logical to transfer this tendon rather than the conjunct tendon. So I, to summarize, on your left you have a normal shoulder, in the middle the latage procedure 
and on your right, the dynamic anterior stabilization performed with the long head of the biceps. Indications are anterior inferior glenohumeral instability with limited bone loss. It has to be less than 20%, and I will explain you later on why. Uh, it's a perfect indication for unstable, painful shoulder. Uh, patients um, that have hyperlaxity and instability, and of course, patients with associated slap lesions. So this is a video uh, that lasts a minute. I will summarize the, the surgery step biceps. You penetrate with, you know, with, with a usual posterior portal after uh, testing your shoulder. See, this is a live surgery that I did last year, the ANSI. Uh, so posterior viewing portal, you inspect the anterior glenoid, you see that there is um, moderate bone loss, there is a long head of the biceps, and you create with, um, with the help of your needle, um, uh, anterolateral portal uh, at parallel with the uh, subscapularis. This is a loose body that we will remove. You, see, you saw that there is a small heel sac lesion, so you open uh, quite widely the, the rotator interval. And then this is one of the important steps. You create an horizontal split in the capsule at the level of your split, of your subscapillary split. So you already prepare your split from the, rotator, um, from the rotator interval with your electrofrequency, but you just cut the capsule. You don't burn any muscle fibers. You cut the capsule until you see the subscapularis muscle. And this is the key because it will, uh, la, la, here, it's perfect. It will allow you later on to do a very, uh, a, a split easily, an easy split. Then you move anteriorly, you prepare the conjunct tendon, you remove you remove the clavideltopectoral fascia, you go down until you see the upper part of the pec major and you prepare the anterior um, subscapularis. Then you cut the biceps at the level of the glenoid. So you take as much biceps as possible and you prepare your anterior uh, glenoid. So you move, you move your scope through the anterolateral portal. You, you do a good movement of the anterior uh, glenoid. Don't remove too much bone. There is preserved bone. So we just with the wraps make a small uh, debridement and then you pass a suture through the labrum. This is important because it will allow you to move your labrum anteriorly or posteriorly, depending uh, of, the, uh, of the step. You put a wire in, in your glenoid, and then you drill at four. You make a small hole on your uh, anterior glenoid, and this is where you will push your biceps. Then you move anteriorly. You will find the biceps uh, laterally to the, in the groove. You bring the biceps to the skin, and uh, you prepare your biceps with a fiber loop number two. So you small, uh, you, you need to prepare at least two centimeters because two centimeters have to penetrate into the, the glenoid. Then you push your biceps between the conjunct tendon and the subscapularis. And then with an instrument, you go through the posterior portal, through the split of your capsule, through the subscapularis and you just grab the two suture that you push that are attached to the biceps and you bring these two suture into the joint and you see that the biceps is coming easily and at this moment you will do a maximal internal rotation and external rotation and the biceps is on the tension you do your rotation and this will create automatically the, um, the muscle split meaning that you will without burning the muscle, without having problem with the nerve, you will create the split. And then you push with a swivel lock, you push the biceps into the hole and you lock it with a, a 3.9 swivel lock. So this is easy. You do everything through the rotator interval. You don't go through the subscap. This is another example. You just push your biceps and then your 3.9 swivel lock and your biceps will be locked into the anterior glenoid. You can even use the suture, uh, the remnant suture to repair your labrum. So you see very good uh, initial, very strong fixation. And then I repair the labrum with, with uh, three suture tack. And you see that you can really obtain a fantastic result. So there is 
the reinforcement of the capsule with the room head of the biceps that goes through a split that you created in the subscap and the uh, labrum repair. So this is a suture tack and then you cut and you have a very nice bump effect. And if you do a dissection postoperatively in a cadaver, so you see that your long head of the biceps is going through the subscap and then it's fixed on the anterior glenoid. And this is the hammock and sling effect that are created. So again, a small video to remind me to remind you how to do the split. So you an horizontal split in with the viper coming um, through the rotator interval. So you don't you don't walk through the subscap. Everything is done through the rotator interval. Right. This is this is the key until you see the muscle, the fibers of the subscap, but don't do more. So we have an inlay fixation. This is what we published with Philippe Collin. Uh, at the beginning, we use quite big screws, 6.25. We reduced it to 3.9, whatever you want. Uh, at the end of the, at the, of the day, this is quite small hole in a rather large uh, glenoid. You can do an in fixation, but some people use the biceps and for an only fixation, a leg from Russia, use actually the long head of the biceps to reconstruct the labrum. So he put, he put the biceps along the labrum and fix it with uh, all, um, anchors. And all, all the surgeons are drilling from posterior to have an only fixation. You can have both. The split, so you find the split that you created in the capsule, you push your instrument through the muscle, through the subscapularis, and then you will have to find the two suture of the long head of the biceps that have been pushed between the subscap and between the conjunct tendon. So here we are to anterior, we have the conjunct tendon, we push the suture uh, that are attached to the long head of the biceps. And this suture will be pushed between the conjunct tendon and the subcap. You find then your instrument, you grab the two sutures. And as there is only muscle, it's going to come very easily into the joint. So then you just push your two suture, you pull the two suture into the joint from the posterior portal and your biceps will penetrate into, um, into the, the, the joint. So this is what I do, grab the sutures, instrument coming from the posterior portal. I find, find my two sutures. I know that I'm far away from the nerve and then I just pull and you see that very easily your biceps will join. And at this moment, I do the internal and external rotation to create the split. So I pull, pull, pull gently and up the biceps is now into the joint under tension. You see the biceps now. And so the biceps is going through the subscap. I think it's quite clear. Again, you can see the video. So biceps is here and then internal external rotation. Have a look to what will happen when I put the biceps and tension on the tension. This create automatically your split. So you don't need to find the nerve. You don't need to burn the muscle fibers. Everything is created automatically. So this is something that uh, we study, it has been submitted. The length of the split after maximal uh, internal and external rotation is around two millimeter, uh, 20 millimeters. So this is quite good up to 32. So this is unlikely to limit external rotation. And then, and this is one of the key points, if you put two centimeters of the tendon into the glenoid, there is almost no elongation. We are quite isometric. And this is why we do not observe um, biceps cramps or Popeye sign postoperatively. And then this is on your left before the surgery. So there is no labrum, no, um, uh, no bump effect. And postoperatively, you have reattached the labrum. So you have a very nice um, bump effect. Postoperative rehabilitation, and this is the cool thing of the procedure, it's exactly like, like the Latarget. 
So 10 days of sling, and then they can stretch. They stretch from day one to six weeks. Uh, I ask them not to do some sport until six weeks, no flexion of the elbow against resistance, because of course, you have the graph, the graph that is attached on the glenoid. Uh, you, you don't want to pull on the graph. I ask them not to carry. And you see that after one week, this lady, she doesn't have a very good external rotation uh, yet. It will, it's coming progressively, but at, at one week, she already has a very nice elevation. And I, she will stretch every day and everything will come back naturally. And the goal when I see them at six weeks is almost complete elevation, usually 160 and something like 20 or 30 degrees of external rotation. This is the, re the rehabilitation that uh, I recommend after this surgery. This is another patient, you know, a very serious a, a Swiss guy, typically a Swiss guy. Um, he's 10 days after the, um, the surgery. Uh, we just removed the sutures and you see that actively he's, he's already doing quite well. He doesn't have a good external rotation, but after 10 days, this is uh, logical. I do not expect more. Uh, so this surgery has some theoretical advantages. It provides the hammock effect when the arm is between zero and 90 degrees of abduction. And then above 90 degrees of abduction, it provides the sling effect that are, as I said previously, very important stabilizing factors. It eliminates the risk of nerve dissection. So it's easier and safer than the atroscopic latergen. There is no traction on the car coracoid process, so no risk of lesion of the musculocutaneous nerve. Then you drill inferiorly. Remember that your, um, your drill is going through the rotator interval, so you are going down, meaning that there is less risk for the suprascapular nerve um, that we have during the latarges, so less risk of axillary nerve damage, musculocutaneous damage, ax um, suprascapular nerve damage. So this is uh, a good point. It has other advantages. Um, there is no coracoid transfer, so the procedure can be performed only with three small incision. It avoids cortical resorption. I just remind you that after a latage, we have up to 30, uh, 41% of graft resorption. This is, of course, not the, ca the case with this surgery. There is no screws, no graft overhanging, so it reduces probably the probability of dislocation or tropathy. And as you do not cut the pectoralis minor, you avoid, you avoid uh, Scapular, postoperative scapular dyskinesis. So quite a lot of advantages. However, there are some drawbacks. One of the strong effects of the latarge is the, the pass of the latarge that goes, uh, of the conjunct tendon, excuse me, that goes initially down and then have to go through the split and is going down. With this technique, it's like the Bristol procedure, the long head, the, the biceps, and the the short head of the long head is going straight. So there is no, the, 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 the bizarre way uh, of the conjunct tendon that we have during the latage. That is probably one of the stabilizing fire factors. Um, is it biomechanically relevant? This is something that we published um, last year. This is the result without, um, without bony lesion. So it's only with the Boncard defect. You see that the, the DAS is, even if it at, uh, we without bone life, even if it's not statistically significant, there is already a trend with more step, um, more relative anterior translation than the Boncart and than the native situation. When you have a 10% bone defect, this is becoming statistically significant. The DAS is better than the Boncart and it's also stronger than nature. And this is, I just remind you, this is what we want. We want something that is very strong, stronger than, than nature because nature failed. And finally, if there is a large bond effect, plus 20% of bond effect, the effect is so strong that the human head does not even reach the native starting position. And this is why we do not recommend the DAS procedure for um, large bone defect because the effect is so strong that your, your human head remain a little bit 
two posterior. So to summarize, the translation of the human head stops less anterior after DAS. So this is a very good point, but enlargement defect and application of a low um, force the human head does not reach the native starting position. So it's probably not so good if you have an important bone defect. So I had some problem. I have to admit, I had some problem during the learning curve. Um, at the beginning, I, um, uh, I recommend to my patient because I was quite afraid an immobilization of one month, like I was doing with my bone card stabilization. And I have to admit that I had some stiffness. I had, since I begin, um, three recurrences that were obviously bad indication with either too much bone loss or too small sleeve locked. Uh, when I was, well, if you do a, a, a hole at six, you really need to put a 6.25 sweep lock, not something that is smaller. And since I understood the, this problem and since I'm doing everything through the rotator interval, uh, I have very, very good result and I didn't have any uh, recurrences yet. I know it will come, but didn't have yet. So in my practice, no more isolated bone card because uh, I had too many recurrences with isolated bone card. So I now prefer the dynamic anterior stabilization than the remplissage. I do remplissage, uh, excuse me, I do that in patients that do not practice contact sports with limited bone loss. And if I have a doubt, if I have large bone loss, I still do an open latage. That is uh, really a good surgery with um, important bone loss. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you have to know that I'm part of the organizing committee of the French Arthroscopic Society. This will, this will be this year in Geneva. Um, it's a very high level congress, so everything will be translated uh, in English. So if you want to come and visit my very nice city, feel free to come. And we also organize a, a, a high level uh, shoulder course in Valise in April this year. Uh, this is a three day, a new format, three days, uh, very intense uh, course. You feel free to come. It's going to be a fantastic congress. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lederman, for that fantastic presentation and your innovative technique to manage uh, shoulder instability. Uh, a few key, uh, questions. Yes. You mentioned you mentioned three recurrences, right? So, out of how many patients did you have three recurrences? Total number so, of surgeries. Yeah, I, I had since the um, since the beginning of my experience, thirty two patients yet, and. Uh, Philippe Collin didn't have any recurrences. He began, he began a little bit later than me. So I think that he has been clever and learned from my mistakes. So altogether, we have almost uh, 50 patients with these two, uh, three recurrences. Okay, so that will be around 6% recurrence rate, right? Yes. Yeah, but it is very low compared to the classic bone card surgery, isn't it? Uh, actually, uh, you know, some people reported zero uh, percent of recurrences after a bon card. So uh, I will say it's lower than my experience because I, I had clearly more. I, I was around 30% uh, of recurrences. That is far too much. That is in my hand, for me, unacceptable. Uh, Dr. Lederman, uh, how many other, I have I've noted that most of the studies on dynamic antidepressant stabilization have happened somewhere between 2018, 2019, and 2020. And uh, more of the studies were from your group, Colin, Mizell, uh, I mean, of course, Dr. Lederman. Uh, are other authors also have been published on the same subject? Yeah, so there is a very, very nice uh, publication of the OGSM uh, that I confirm exactly our, our result or findings. It's also a biomechanical study. Uh, and uh, everything has been confirmed. So we, we are not the only one to have um, published or, uh, a biomechanical study. The, the publication of Tong, and I agree, was only a technical publication. So now we wait for, uh, we have the one, year, the one year result that will be presented during the next SSEC Congress. And um, we are waiting, of course, for the two, year, two years result. And this is something that we have to 
continue to follow because as Christian Gerber um, observed, um, we can have recurrences after a bond card up to five, 10 years. So we need to follow our patient during for, for a long time, but we will do this. And are you planning to do any level one studies on the subject? Have you enrolled in a clinical trial or something? Yep, yeah, so there is a clinical, uh, uh, the, the submission to ethical committee has been done. This is a study that is supported by Artrex and this is a comparative study, um, dynamic contest stabilization versus ILSAC samplissage. So the, this is an ongoing study. So you're comparing uh, dynamic anterior versus remplissage, is it? Correct, correct. And uh, if you're planning to do a, a DAS or the dynamic anterior stabilization, up to how much of glenoid bone loss is acceptable for this procedure? So uh, I would say I will be absolutely confident. Uh, for me, 20% will be the limit because of the result that we show you. So uh, I will try to remain under 20%. Above 20%, I move to a latarge. Uh, of course, you're a very high-profile shoulder surgeon. What are the indications for a remplissage under your, uh, in your experience? For doing a remplissage, what are your primary indications? Um, so I need to be honest, since uh, I'm doing Latarge, I almost stopped to do remplissage. So I will have to redo remplissage for this level one study. Um, but until now, I, I was treating remplissage uh, with Latarge increasing, increasing the articular arch rather than doing the remplissage because of this posterior pain that we, we had. Okay, and are you performing any arthroscopic uh, lethargies? Correct, so I began in 2011 and I have been the first one to publish my uh, a comparative study. Uh, we published it in uh, the, um, the KESTA journal in 2016 and um, I, I had more complication with the Latarge procedure. It was harder, um, more complication, and uh, radiologically, I was not, not so happy. And since all study that has been uh, published confirm my findings, meaning that this is feasible, you can have very good uh, result with uh, the Latarge procedure. However, there is no real advantage so that's why I moved back to an open latarge. What is the general consensus among the shoulder surgeons regarding arthroscopic latarge? I think that you can, you can do arthroscopic latarge if, first of all, you know how to do an open latarge, because at the beginning you will, you will have some conversion. And the second point is um, you, need to, you, you need to be a high volume center or high volume center surgeon because you cannot do uh, five arthroscopic latarge per year. This is a nonsense. <laughs> I mean, you at, least, you, you at least have to do 50 or 70 in order to have enough volume to do it properly. And um, uh, you, you, you know, this is a tricky surgery. This is not an easy one. And at the end, the, the, there are some patients that are sleeping and you don't want to, to harm them. It, it, you don't want to create more damage. So if you are a good surgeon, high volume, high volume surgeon, uh, this is a reliable technique. It has been proved. And uh, Pascal Boileau, Laurent Lafos did a fantastic job. Uh, if, you don't do, if you don't do enough, keep doing an open attache. You will have fantastic results. OK, thank you. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Lederman, for your valuable time. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you very much for joining and sharing your experience. It was lovely listening to you and your new concept of dynamic anterior shoulder stabilization. I'm sure within a few years, it's going to be one of the most accepted procedures all over the world. Thank you very much. I thank you for the invitation. Good evening. Bye-bye.